and welcome to NAAE's webinar series. My name is Judy Browse, and I'm the Executive Director of NAAE, and we are so thrilled that you could join us. You're in for a treat here. Um, and today we have three very special presenters, Dilla Fruz Williams, Robin Moore, and Nilda Costco, who will be talking about learning gardens and learning landscapes and the work that all of them are doing to connect young people to nature. I'll introduce them in a minute, but if you've never heard of these three, you're in for an amazing treat, and this topic couldn't be more timely or important, especially as we're learning more about the value of connecting people to nature and the value of school gardens and learning and how we can apply research to practice to have even more impact. So it's very exciting times for all of you working in this area. I also wanted to thank all our affiliate co-hosts who are working with NAAE to sponsor these monthly webinar series. So thank you all for joining. And for those of you who haven't been on one of our monthly webinars, we have been trying for the last over um, two years to have a monthly webinar to talk about highlighting new ideas in the field, showcasing leaders that are thinking about things differently or have expertise that can help us all. And our goal is actually to inspire us and to improve practice and really think about improving the quality. So let us know if you have ideas of other topics you'd like to see in the future, um, because it's really a great opportunity for all of us to learn from each other. And the next webinar will be on March 20th from 3 to 4.15 with Michael Margolis. And if you don't know Michael, he's an amazing storyteller. He's been working with nonprofits and companies like Facebook for years. And I think you'll all enjoy that as well of how we can tell better stories that help us get to where we want to go. So what we're going to do today, very quick intro to using Zoom for those of you who are not familiar with it. The bulk of this is hearing from our wonderful speakers. At the end, we will have questions and discussion and then a few closing thoughts from each of our speakers. So I'm going to go very quickly here. Um, we're using Zoom. All your audio lines are muted because we would have too much feedback, but you can send us messages anytime through the chat function. You just go to the chat box, type in a note, and it can go to everyone, or you can just send it to the panelists. We will be monitoring your questions and thoughts, so um, please feel free throughout the presentation to post things. If you have resources or ideas or questions, please share them with everybody on the line. That's how we all learn. And again, we will be taking questions at the end. And for those that we don't get to, we will answer any remaining questions. Thanks to our three speakers who have volunteered to help us um, answer the questions and we'll post them on EE Pro. And we'll be sending everybody a link to this webinar, which we are recording. So I want to thank our um, wonderful um, associates who are helping. Kristen Grimm, who's the head of research here at NAAE and helping me with the webinar series, and Sai, who's our communications um, guru, who is helping us on all aspects related to social media and the webinar. So if you have any problems, just text them or use the chat box. So now it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce our speakers, and I'm going to introduce all three um, and if you don't know these folks, I'm going to give very short intros. Please look them up online to look at the depth and breadth of what they have covered in their careers. Um, it's amazing. And while I'm introducing them, I'm going to have Robin take over control because he's going to go next. So let me start with Robin. And let me just tell you about this too, this amazing couple. So Robin and Nilda are two incredible leaders in the areas of connecting young people to nature and together they co-founded the Natural Learning Initiative, or NLI, which you'll learn more about today when they're talking, but we've been so lucky to work with them on the Natural Start Alliance, which is our early childhood and EE um, program, and it's been such an honor to collaborate with them. So first, Robin Moore, he has worked in the field of landscape architecture as an educator, research, and consultant for most of his career. He's an international authority, on the design of children's play and learning environments and participatory public open space design. His design for children's spaces in the US include the well-known environmental yard in Berkeley, California, which received an award for outstanding contributions to the practice of design research by the Environmental Design Research Association. 
He's also been involved in the design of so many nature play areas across the country and internationally at zoos, at parks, at airports, and other facilities. And his work in the design of outdoor play facilities has been used as a model in numerous other countries. Currently is a consultant to an interdisciplinary team working in the city of Lisbon in Portugal. And as the director of NLI, Robin is currently involved in the design and renovation of dozens of outdoor spaces for preschool, special education facilities, and school grounds in North Carolina. So that's Robin. Nilda is the director of programs with NLI and a research associate professor with the College of Design at North Carolina State University. Her research is focused on the impact of outdoor environments on children and family health, such as healthy nutrition, active lifestyles, attention functioning, and overall well-being. At NLI, Nilda's responsibilities include design programming and conducting research on outdoor environments for children with and without dis disabilities, developing training activities for designers, educators, and other community members who want to create really high quality outdoor environments for children and families. And she coordinates statewide comprehensive projects for designing new programs, training, and evaluation. Um, we'll then move to talk about connecting young people to nature through gardens after Nilda's done. And we're excited to have the amazing Dilla Fruz Williams here, who has been another longtime friend of NAAE. So Dilla Fruz is a professor and co-founder of Leadership for Sustainability Education at Portland State University and a fellow at the Institute for Sustainable Solutions. She founded an environmental school, many school gardens, and a learning gardens lab on a 12-acre property that functions as a research and education site serving educators and their students, many of whom are low-income immigrants or refugees. Dillafruz's recent research has focused extensively on using garden-based education to enhance the holistic and academic learning of young people. She studied school gardens across 12 states in the U.S. and in many other countries around the world. She's championed policies for equity and excellence for more than 50,000 students in the Portland area, and she was invited to the White House as part of a delegation of the Council to discuss education funding initiatives during the Obama administration. She's the author of more than 200 publications and has conducted keynotes and workshops around the world. And her scholarship includes environmental education, service learning, social justice, and strategic school community and university partnerships. So it's an amazing lineup. And I'm now gonna turn this over to Robin Moore to get us started. Take it away, Robin. Okay, thank you, Judy. and. Uh... Thank you to NAAE for hosting this effort to get the word out. We really appreciate it. So I'm gonna try talking about how the uh, built environment, especially the bio design of the environment can motivate learning. And I'm trying to advance my slides. Okay, sorry, a little glitch there. So. Uh, Judy uh, mentioned the uh, Natural Learning Initiative that Nilda and I founded uh, just 20 years ago. And so we have the big picture of focusing on the health of the biosphere and the health of generations to come. And we focus on three areas of activity, design assistance, interdisciplinary action research, professional development, as we're doing today, and dissemination of information. Uh, also a bit of that. So the Natural Learning uh, Initiative was, was uh, really founded on prior work. And uh, Judy also mentioned this project, which was a, a very large thing else that's living uh, that kids can experience every day that became the book Natural Learning. And uh, so working with students at the university over a period of time, it became this. So obviously the bio quality of that site is um, increased and demonstrates the power of nature to take back itself take back the land and uh, so proof in concept here <laughs> so onward from there and um, a lot of documentation of how children use that natural learning area in their play construction uh, learning 
in various kinds of ways, oftentimes very, very small components of that living landscape, as you can see here, won't have time to go into the detail today. Um, their, in, their curiosity and intrigue by very small critters living in that um, habitat where the native animals from the surrounding neighborhood came to be residents, studying it, doing a census of animal life, um, understanding the hydrologic cycle because we had a pretty elaborate water environment on that site with ponds and so forth. So um, indoors, outdoors, exploring nature outdoors, bringing samples back indoors, seeing how metamorphosis, for example, works, just indoor outdoor education. We learned early on that gardening was the easy thing to do that teachers could get engaged in very easily and uh, across all of the disciplines, especially science, but also culture. And so we saw through this experiment that playing, learning, and education really existed along a continuum for children of this age. This is five to eight year olds. And um, we ran uh, summer programs that were very successful using that same uh, landscape for kids from the neighborhood, an integrated program, a bunch of kids with disabilities of different kinds. So we also learned that um, it's not just learning about nature, it's learning with nature and learning through nature. Um, met several different aspects of learning involving nature. So jumping forward several years, we're now in North Carolina where something rather momentous happened in 2007, mm -hmm. which is that the Division of Child Development changed the term playground to outdoor learning environment in the rules affecting childcare centers. So we have 47 hundred um, childcare centers in North Carolina serving about a quarter of a million kids each day. And we look at their, those sites as 4,700 points of light. And Nilda is going to talk, I think, a little bit about the uh, model that we developed to work on those centers. Very typically, as you see here, the forest was scraped away to make the childcare centers. So you're oftentimes starting from not much on the ground and having to restore nature. Um, so in these centers, if you don't know childcare centers, kids spend most of their lives there until five years old, eight to 10 hours a day, five days a week, year round, most meals, most activity. And so we work on designs for these sites, working around what's there already, working directly with the teachers and owners and directors of the sites, very community engaged kind of process. As you see here, working together, we have a, a, a way of developing designs quite quickly. And then implementation on the site itself is an in, in, incremental process. So it can last uh, up to several years. Uh, but here you see one year later, quite a big impact. Now we're going to that site and documenting the changes in behavior that occur. So it's an environment and behavior kind of approach to things. We're ultimately interested in changing behavior, right? Through design, that's the, that's the plan. And so in this case, using behavior mapping, we're able to demonstrate quite conclusively the uh, function of the primary pathway that's connecting up all the other different activity settings. And basically the level of sedentary activity has switched to moderate mm -hmm. over, the, over the course of that um, installation. So we work with this uh, activity setting concept. As you can see here, 30 activity settings on our list. Um, maybe a good site has 10 or 12 activity settings and they can go beyond that. As I said, uh, done over several times, over, over several years usually. Um, so some of those settings, welcoming entrance, you know, is this a friendly place? Is it child orientated as you move around the outdoor learning environment along these primary pathways? Are you enveloped by nature, active, engaged, immersed in nature, looking here at the uh, vine that is growing over the arbor and then off of the main path into these small secondary pathways that really get down into nature for children, especially from a multi-century point of view, exploring for wildlife, turning over rocks. You know, some of this stuff is so easy to do and children are so curious. They'll turn those rocks over just to figure out what's going on underneath. And at the same time, kind of connecting together, sharing life with each other. And um, it's all really small scale. Look at these guys just, uh, getting excited about earthworms or picking off the fence. So we try to green up the fence lines 
Um, are we understanding wh wh where bees come to eat, where hummingbirds come to eat? We can suck on that nectar and taste it. Uh, we can do gardening. And of course, Dilafruz is going to talk much more about this, but we are absolutely totally into gardening. There's a choo-choo garden on the top right. And uh, we've been developing this indoors and outdoors. And this is all children under five years old, right? So it's uh, gardening also as a learning process. Uh, of course, very important nutrition, learning where food comes from, learning what the earth has to offer, but also preparing food together, snacking on it, getting used to eating uh, fresh fruit and vegetables. And then from, so from early childhood to just a couple of closing thoughts here. One, how you take that into the uh, non-formal education context. So we had the great good fortune to develop an edible schoolyard at the um, Greensboro Children's Museum. This is modeled on the one in Berkeley, Alice Waters' uh, original model. And so this is a learning garden that's devoted to um, community education about nutrition, growing fruits and vegetables. It's very international. So there's fruit and vegetables from all around the world. And we have chickens and rabbits and uh, <laughs> kids just have a lot of fun. Um, each summer they have a fantastic program. They develop a children's farmer's market. They sell the produce to their parents. Uh, <laughs> and it's all about seed to plant, to harvest, to cooking, to eating. They have a complete kitchen there, which is just great. And lastly, you know, how do we take this into the community in terms of just your standard playground, right? So we've been working on this kind of model for a long time, engaging the children in the design process. In this case, universally designed playgrounds are very, very different. Growing over the years, naturalizing to the point where you are then there and developed in nature. This is a completely designed landscape. Yes, it has manufactured play equipment in it, but it has pockets of green scattered throughout. So, so families come here and stay two or three hours. They just love being there because it's so comfortable, so green. Um, uh, flowering plants year round, very active. And there we are, you know, engaged in nature, wherever you can find it, in the everyday lives of children and families. So now I'm going to um, pass on to Nilda. Thank you, Robin. That was fantastic. We're giving you a virtual applause. If you have questions, please feed them through the chat box. And Nilda, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I would like to talk with you about very young children. And I think this is a scale of children that perhaps are not considered in design or even in environmental education. So uh, I would like to say we need to say uh, to these children, welcome to planet Earth. This is a great planet and uh, we are caring for the planet just for you. Uh, so some, uh, some of our um, colleagues say, well, being in touch with nature is like vitamin G, some people because of green, but some people say, well, maybe it's N for nature. But we are all in agreement that this is good for everybody. It is a healthy human habitat for all of us, and of course, specifically for very young children. So today, I decided that I'm going to tell some stories, some stories about rearing children and some stories about how they live and how they experience the, the space as experience learning. So uh, these are some of my stories, and I hope you bear with me and think about this, uh, because uh, some things happen differently in different parts of the world. So um, we were in a conference some years ago in, uh, in Denmark. It was a cold day. They had a garden. They have children outside. Uh, it was so cold. They have fire. Uh, in the courtyard, and we were in this uh, very nice setup for a conference. And I see um, a lady there in the conference that uh, spent like two hours uh, as, as, until I realized that she was there for a purpose against the, the window. The window you can see is halfway or a little bit open. So um, I um, 
I was observing and then I I went to the window to see what was um, on the other side and I saw a stroller. I talked to the lady um, and I said, what is there? And I said, well, it's my child. So I went out, I look at this place. I Effectively, there was a stroller. I look and I, take a, I took a peek and there was a baby inside of the stroller. And so I had a conversation with her and I said, uh, why you have your baby outside? And she looked at me with a, a very strange look like I was asking some stupid question. And she, she says, because the clean air is outside, not inside with a hundred people in this room. And I felt a little bit, um, you know, inadequate because she was absolutely right. Uh, so uh, it was not a problem. It was not a, an a, a mother that was abandoning the child outside. In fact, she was caring for this child and the child was enjoying that very fresh, a little bit more than fresh, maybe cold air. So um, after lunch, uh, of course, she, she took out and, and, and she went. But for me, it was a very interesting way of understanding how the rearing practices has to do with this engagement with the natural world. Uh, so how, how do children learn? Uh, well, they, they learn by doing things, by acting on images and uh, uh, events and objects. And um, because to know is to modify, to transform, to do something uh, with whatever is inside. And why, why is this? You know, it, this has a biological uh, base. And this is because of the way our brain cells work. There is so much research now in brain development. But what is really interesting is if you can see my uh, slide, I kind of go into in depth in this, but at eight months old, we have 570 million connections in a pin head, uh, but it decreases after because this is the, the issue of you use it or you lose it. So what, what do we need? You know, we need to use this and you can see scans and you can see what happens, you know, the human brain at birth at six years old and at, at 14 years old is, is already trimmed. Uh, some of the connections are trimmed. So if you would look uh, into the brain, we would say, well, we have the brain, a big area for the hands and, the, and the, of course, the mouth and the nose and all the, sens the sensory system. And there are some um, incredible features or, or figures like this one from the Natural History Museum of London. If we would um, depict this image of the, in the brain, we will have this sensory homunculus model, uh, which is funny, but is is real. Is a way we uh, appreciate the world. So, what are we doing with our children? How do we can engage them with nature? Well, we need to give them enriched environments uh, to support the normal brain and the development. So we know that, uh, you know, the interaction with the environment improves the structure, chemistry, and function of the brain, at least in rats, but we are so close to rats that uh, we, we could say this, uh, you know, happens to us too. So, so what happens, <clears throat> other uh, people say, well, intelligence is in large part the product of this interaction with the environment, like this child that is interacting with these uh, medicinal plants. So that, that's what we suggest. Now, what happens in, in our world? You know, it seems that we, we, we are always in this dichotomous world. Is the, the child living in a bubble or we are going to leave the child you know, wild and expose them to uh, dangers. What if we go to a, a happy medium where we offer these uh, stimulations at a daily, you know, where they are? And Robin was talking a little bit about this, you know, how can we enrich this environment? This is a infant and toddler environment uh, close to, to us. We have been working with this center where you have fragrances and colors and textures and this changes 
um, uh, over the seasons and around um, you know the year, and you have spaces for interaction for multi-age interactions. So what happens is, and we have seen this repeatedly, that uh, you know when we create these environments, uh, life attracts life, right? Would you don't put a, an invitation for the um, little creatures and insects to come, they come and children discover them. Like this child that discovered um, a grasshopper and follow the grasshopper. I don't know if you can see in the last uh, image on, on the right, uh, the grasshopper, because of course it was uh, faster than the child and, and it jumped in the flower bed. But what an experience for this young ch child to be able to, at such an early stage of life, to be able to see this creature and be close up. Or these children that prefer to be um, very in contact with, the, with nature, full body contact, I would say, even if there are pathways and there are other places, well, they prefer to go through the shrubs and be brushed, you know, gently by the plants uh, or the children that uh, play with uh, these nature loose parts that support engagement, exploration. These children were piling leaves on top of this semicircular um, uh, surface. And of course, the, the product of, of that pile was falling down again, and they would do it again and again, uh, you know, uh, as part of the exploration. So I said, how children learn, to know an object, to know an event, is not simply to look at it. So it's to act on it, it's to be part of it. Like these children, I call this experiential learning in these grasses, very young. They spend a lot of time in this corner that was planted with these grasses because there was a problem and the, the water was uh, uh, pulling up there and so, but it, it was a place that they discovered and you can see how much exploration they, they can do just being there. You can see the concentration, the focus, the attention they have. Um, look at the hand and look at how he is just touching and feeling this grass. So I think uh, these are the experiential uh, spaces that we need to create not only for children, but also for caregivers. And I would say day for daily, daily experience at the childcare center and at home. There is nothing better than being able to enjoy the outdoors since very early on, year round. And I would say, uh, please, if you have a question and if you think that somebody with six years of experience in any topic is an expert, next time you have a question about children and nature, ask a six-year-old. Thank you. Nilda, that was fantastic. Thank you. And Dilla Fruz, do you want to take over control? Yes. Um, that would be fantastic. And again, to everybody, please type in any questions. You guys are fantastic, right on time. There's so much more we could talk about with all of this. And, and we'll hear from Dilla Fruz first, and then we'll have questions. So okay. take it away, Dilla Fruz. We can see your screen. And there we go. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Wonderful. Well, thank you to uh, NAAAE, Judy, Kristen, and all of the other support staff. And it's also been a pleasure to plan this a little bit with Nilda and with Robin. Uh, I will be talking about learning gardens and nature connections and uh, mostly focus on diversity and inclusion. And um, a lot of my work is with uh, children, uh, pre-K through eight, mostly uh, K through eight in schools, but I've also looked at school gardens through uh, grade 12 and some preschool programs. So today I hope to invite you to consider what's the learning in learning gardens? What are the outcomes? The interesting questions that I've been always wondering about and researching and trying to really uh, write about. The second one that I hope we can discuss today is how do we honor diversity and inclusion 
um, not so much as an afterthought, but as core commitment. That means keeping it at the center of our work. It's almost a given that we should be doing that. And to do that, I'll be using two frameworks as support. The first framework is Community Cultural Wealth Model from Tara Yoso and her colleagues. And the second is from the pedagogical principles with the acronym GARDENS, how much better could it get uh, from the book uh, that I've written with John Brown. Now, my own passion for this work starts with my own background in botany and my connection with gardens and my love for children and wanting to just provide ways in which teachers and parents and children of all ages can come together to actually be enamored by the wonders of nature. And over the past two decades, I've been engaged with mostly urban, low income, uh, ethnic and racial minority kids. And a lot of those students are immigrant and refugee populations that have been settled in Portland um, around, around a certain corridor in Southeast Portland mostly. And so a lot of the schools that I've worked with are in that area. And then my own research grants and publications for those of you who might not have time later on to wait and discuss this. There is an NSF funded project. We received uh, half a million dollars uh, for a three year longitudinal study where we connected the science content with next generation science standards and then uh, did longitudinal studies and some of the research will be coming out soon. And any of the research papers can be accessed through the website here in the book. So our realities right now, of course, are smartphones. And you know, we're very proud that they are called smart, who wouldn't be? But I would wager that with the work that I've been doing and many of you who've joined in, I'm sure, and what Nilda and uh, Robin just shared, is there is this soil smartness. Kids who are engaging with soil, kids who are engaging with real life questions, real life issues. And I think that that is to be, uh, we should be lauding that kind of, uh, uh, these efforts. So I'm, I was just trying to turn the page here. Um, now the history and context of, of the research is that, you know, there's been a proliferation of school gardens across the United States and countries across continents. And I've visited several of them. 7,000 school gardens, I think that's actually a, a not the right number. They're pretty, pretty there are many more. And in Oregon alone, we have 668 gardens. So it's not a new phenomenon. What is new is that there's a resurgence of interest since the 1990s. And if you look at the research that is emerging, if you look at the literature, you find that there are several issues that are bringing this interest in school gardens to the forefront. The first is food insecurity, the fact that we have E. coli and salmonella breakouts, uh, health concerns around diabetes too and obesity and stress, and then you know, the overstimulation of, uh, with technology and almost addiction to technology. And then finally, disengagement from schools with high dropout rates, and which is a result of irrelevance of education from real life. So, if we look at the demographics, and uh, as I said, my, my topic today is really talking about diversity and inclusion. So if you look at the statistics, if you look at the um, census data, this is from NCES, you know, we find, and we all know this, that the white student population, uh, the enrollment of white students in public schools has been dropping, as it continues to decline. And it will through 2026, and that the Hispanic and Asian Pacific Islander students will uh, continue to be, their enrollment will continue to be on the rise. And so that is causing some concerns as we see, uh, you know, in our political climate right now that, that we are uh, facing. You know, so anyway, there is going to be increased diversity, at least in terms of the ethnic and racial breakdown of our student population. Furthermore, um, if you look at the large school districts, if you go to their websites, and I did this, and you look at the home languages that are spoken, you find that in Portland Public, for instance, there are 94 home languages. Seattle Public, 143. Minnesota Public, 90. Cincinnati Public, 63. And on and on. And I have a huge list of all of these large urban schools, uh, districts that have kids 
who speak a different language at home, sometimes two languages at home. Like I was brought up bilingual at home and English was not my language. I come from India. But you find that uh, the list that, that is here on the, on the screen shows you that some of the top languages that are spoken at home, Spanish, Vietnamese, Cantonese, and so on in, in Portland public schools, and on and on. And I think that this raises an important uh, issue for us. And that is in my work in the Learning Gardens Lab, for instance, at the schools that we work with, there are 20 to 25 languages spoken at home. And these children are being taught in English, uh, many of whom do not have parents or home environments where English is spoken. And so rather than seeing them as having some sort of a deficit, not knowing English, we ought to be actually celebrating the fact that they know other languages. Anyway, I thought it would be a good time to ask ourselves, how many families have we interacted with that speak a language other than English at home? And how often, how often do we interact with uh, children and families that don't necessarily speak English at home? I think that's an important part of our struggle with trying to deal with issues of diversity and inclusion. So in the next few slides, I'll take you through the kinds of sort of gardens. And what I want you to look at is the engagement of teachers and students, and also just the variety of gardens like you see here. Here's one in Chicago where I've been visiting for almost 10 years. These are kindergartners planting actually new beds. Hawaii, where you, you know, the kids, when they come to the garden, they actually will stand at the gate and they'll pause and they'll take permission to enter the garden, permission from the garden. Those are sacred spaces. They don't just push and shove and you know, stroll in and uh, so on and so forth. They begin to first be mindful of the fact that they're gonna be entering the space. And you have here you know, children building carb ovens and carb benches and you know, parents used to ask me, what is kale chips? And uh, you know, children are able to take kale from the gardens kale that they grow and then they make chips in the uh, cob oven and they love it. Compost delights, talk about compost and children will jump into it to look for critters. And adolescents will tell you over and over again how much they hate sitting still in chairs and they want to be out there, you know, they want their bodies to be active. Here are some signs in different languages at the Learning Gardens Laboratory uh, that I co-founded in uh, 2004. And here is a Spanish and Mandarin immersion school where the children come out to the gardens and there's a wonderful quad with the garden where they learn the uh, foods in various languages in Spanish and Mandarin and some of the parents come there and teach that. And I think also most significantly here you notice that you know, kids are actually writing, they're drawing and this back and forth connection between the classroom and the garden is what I have been really interested in for a long time. The point being that if we're going to have gardens on school sites, that in order to be able to legitimize these gardens and their use, we ought to be able to show that actually uh, teachers and kids and students and parents are all using them and in the process of learning their academic subjects, they go back and forth. You know, the garden serves as the milieu, serves as the milieu for learning uh, various subjects, particularly science and language arts and mathematics. This is a school where I was surprised one day to walk in and the teacher herself had put up this, uh, the photographs of children in the garden uh, on the bulletin board, validating the work that they were doing. And this is part of our NSF project, but for teachers to have ownership is what thrills me. So what are students learning? What are the outcomes of garden-based education? Um, in 2013, there was this paper that I published with my co-author Scott on synthesizing the research that was out there from 1990 to 2010. There is a source that I have up there and I'm not gonna go into the details, but I do wanna share that there were dozens and dozens and dozens of outcomes that were list enlisted in the research. And in order to just simplify, I've categorized them as personal, social, and moral development, vocational career-oriented skills, and then academic learning, which has been a lot of my focus, is what curriculum and what subjects are being linked to the garden and how are gardens being used for our teaching purposes. And most of the curriculum that these studies reflected had to do with science, some with language arts and mathematics. But to the right, you see that there's also a whole host of 
uh, outcomes, sense of curiosity, multi-sensory learning, food literacy, healthy eating habits, we know that. And the last one, which is in red, is motivation and engagement. And that's the work that we are doing in Science in the Learning Gardens, where we find that children actually are motivated. We use self-determination theory. We have a psychology professor, Alan Skinner, who's working with us. And if you look to the left, you find that uh, the model, the motivational model of science in the learning gardens is one in which culturally relevant and supportive pedagogical contexts foster high quality motivational experiences in the garden. And we've been doing longitudinal study of sixth graders going to seventh grade to eighth grade. And within a month or so, we hope this article will come out of our first set of results that are absolutely promising in terms of science identity development, the learning that is taking place, and also science grades that we are saying. Now, I, I just want to point out once more that majority of our students are low income in those schools, and uh, they are also um, English language learners, over 50% of them, and, and uh, ethnic and racial minority kids. So to remember that this work is really about students, we need to listen to their voices. And I have tons of data related to student interviews. And here is one where a kid says, at Learning Gardens, it's time to be in your own little world, letting your imagination go wild, planting dreams in the ground and seeing them grow. If I can do this, take care of a plant that I can see I can take care of myself. So these kinds of things kids talk about. Let's now move on to diversity and inclusion for all. And the first framework is the model of community cultural wealth, which I actually use as a kaleidoscope as a metaphor. And this model where Yoso Tara and her partners, they talk about an array of knowledge, skills, abilities, and contacts possessed and utilized by communities of color to survive and resist macro and micro oppression, micro forms of oppression. So here is a kaleidoscope that is used as the framework, uh, as a model. And you will see in the center, there are six capital areas of capital strengths that children bring to the school. And these are linguistic, familial, social, aspirational, navigational, and resistance capital. And what Yoso tells us to do, and I think this applies beautifully to the work we do in Learning Gardens, is that we have to really look upon these as wealth, as capital, as assets, and not as deficits. But I'll, and not, it's not just about, oh, let's look at them as assets, but actually pull in the parents, the children, their social capital to actually do the work that needs to be done in the garden. So these assets are capital is not deficit. We need to get away from simply understanding diversity as a manifestation of statistics and move beyond that to understanding cultural stereotypes and prejudices and also acknowledge our own limitations. You know, we don't understand all of it, but to be authentic and to be committed to find ways to actually integrate all kids in the garden and to learn with them. Here is a, a father from Somalia who had a multicultural family garden in one of our, at, at the Learning Gardens lab. And we found that he was growing okra and I'm a gardener and I didn't know that okra would go in Portland and I learned from him. So we also have what's called culturally responsive curriculum. Eating is a cultural act. What better than food to pull uh, the students and their families in to the discussion about land and growing food. So there are many, many ways, there are many books that can be brought in to actually connect with the lives of the children. Finally, we need to look at this framework of pedagogical principles where we have the acronym gardens, so sense of place, awe, rhythm and scale, diversity, experience, interconnectedness and sensory awakening. Here is the first principle, cultivating a sense of place. We need to remember that many students are uprooted, dislocated, you know, many have been marginalized and they may have been uprooted from places in the United States. So gardens provide place connections through planting a lot of place-based education will tell us that. Collaborating and friendships. Here is a student who says, it's like I'm a member, I'm home, I'm safe, I'm comfortable. They help me do what I need to do. And here is fostering awe, sense of curiosity and wonder. I'm reminded of philosopher Neil Postman who says, why is it that children enter school as a question mark and leave as a period? Good question. Discovering rhythm and scale. You know, here we are 
giving into our technologies and being mindful of and watching these miraculous patterns and scale, drawing them and questioning. They're just incredible when kids do that. All kids can do that. And then there is the Native American stories around Three Sisters Garden, where we plant corn, beans, squash, and how the three sisters support one another in, in growing. Children know about valuing biocultural diversity. Here is a first and second grade class. It's a blended class that actually looks at squash. Now look at the variety of squashes, right? And corn, and then they draw and color them. These are oil pastels, beautiful, just beautiful. And it's back in the classroom learning. Here is an acorn unit that, you know, talks about indigenous knowledge systems. Apples, you know, the colors, the, the perfume, the, uh, the shapes, I mean, on and on, the taste. And here are kids writing haiku uh, on apples. It's as red as blood with stripes of green grass in it. After taste is pie. Okay, moving on, embracing practical experience. I don't have to say much. Nilda covered this beautifully. Kids like hands-on learning and being actively engaged. Nurturing interconnectedness, you know, as they grow and they're washing what they've grown, you know, and then they're sharing and eating and they talk in the process and build friendships and awakening the senses. Um, Robin and uh, Nilda talked about that too, you know, the fragrance, the tastes, you know, of things that kids grow, they just love it. And finally, here's a poem, uh, underground, I call it underground poetry, Beet, beet squashy, bursting with blood, red dye everywhere, smells like buckets of dirt, over sugared, makes me gag. And it's earth trapped in a bottle, the wet plain taste melting on my tongue, that's beet. So it's just delightful to see what happens here. Here are some very, very quickly, I'll cover the kinds of methods we can use to be inclusive. Sit spots, many of you've heard of that. You find a special place, be mindful, still quiet, and sensitize the senses, and lessons of nature seep in, and children will tell you that. Second is wonder wall. You know, asking kids to write about, I wonder about, I wonder how, why, when, if, and then creating a wall of the things that they wonder about. And the other thing that works very well with children, and we have research that shows this, is giving them cameras, telling them to take photographs, especially kids who might who are English language learners, is ask them, use the acronym SAY, what do you see, what's actually happening, what activity is going on, and how does it connect to you? So that's what kids do. They take photographs and they begin to express themselves. They're no more tongue-tied. So here are some things that kids tell us. Uh, I feel safe at the learning gardens. No one is judging me for who I am. It's a circle of life, of friendship. It releases stress from me. I feel really happy and I feel smart. I feel like I feel like a better learner and that's something to remember too. So with that, I think bring it to a close and I welcome your questions and thoughts as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan Fruz. That was fantastic. Three amazing presentations. You all stuck to the exact time. So we have time for questions and we actually have a number of questions that have been sent to me or sent to everybody. So I'm just going to start and this is for all of you if you want to um, chime in. We have a question here from Ariel who wants to know in designing an outdoor learning space what are the most important elements to keep in mind as thought processes and physical elements? Um, and she said um, please note I am not interested in vegetable gardens. So what would you say is most important elements to I, keep in mind? I, <laughs> okay. How many hours do we have? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you know, first of all, it's about context, right? Is it a um, open public space? Um, we're talking about learning, learning space, right? So um, it could be a public space, right? Like in a park or something, but um, learning usually implies well, as I said, there's informal learning, just what you learn through play. I think we've all stressed that. There's non-formal learning, which that can happen in a museum. I showed an example of that. And there's formal learning, which would happen in schools, or there's a mix in, in really progressive schools, there's a mix. So first of all, about context. You know, it's, it, it, the context is going to define some of the things you can do or not do. 
Um, if it's childcare centers, these are highly regulated spaces, so you've got to pay attention to that. So there's all this practical stuff that goes on. In terms of um, actual design principles, we think a lot about circulation, how you move around the space. Uh, kids are constantly moving, and that's good for their health, but they also need to rest and relaxation. There needs to be gathering spaces. You know, so that 30 um, behavior settings or activity settings, as we call them, uh, that I listed begin to um, may help you think about what goes where and how does that map onto the site. Then the site itself, how large is it? Um, is it more than a quarter of an acre? You know, the sites vary in size tremendously. So that's going to influence, influence how you think about the site layout. And then who manages it? And we, we talk a lot about management um, as the broader perspective beyond day-to-day -day maintenance because it's a living landscape. It has to be managed. Uh, who are the managers? What, what are their constraints? What are the resources that can be applied to management? Um, it's a space that's constantly evolving over time. Um, how does the management reflect the way in which the program is being offered to children? And then, of course, I think what Delif Bruz emphasized uh, wonderfully is just the diversity of, of families and children and cultures that are represented. That has to be mapped onto the whole. So therefore, design has to be a community process. I can also share that in Portland, for instance, um, can I, uh, can you hear me? Yes, uh, perfect. In Portland, we have a number of outdoor classrooms uh, where uh, stu students, along with community partners, nonprofits that have supported them to, to actually create outdoor classrooms where the kids are brought out, they sit, there are cob benches that have been created. And many of these outdoor classrooms serve multiple purposes. They also learn about sustainability. They learn about rainwater harvesting. There are rooftop gardens. And kids actually, when they're out there, they're learning about a lot of things. Uh, so those are right on the school grounds that these outdoor spaces have been created. We had a couple of other questions. And again, if we don't get to all the questions that people have submitted, some have sent them to me privately, but somebody was saying it's Barbara that as a parent and educator, she is interested in promoting learning gardens at local public schools. And she's wondering funding sources and how to think about it. And by the way, to all of you, if you've got resources that we can share with everybody, we can do that afterward. That could help summarize some of your research and writing because all of you have published so extensively. But think about resources and then while you're thinking about that, another question was, how do you involve students in the design process? So think about how to get resources for gardens in areas. Uh, Barbara was talking about Seattle in areas that older schools. And then how do you um, involve students in the design process? Two more questions. Any okay, thoughts? I'll, take, I'll, I'll take the one about involving the students. Um, uh, we never go into a design process without the students or without children, even if they are two or three years of age. Uh, they have the best ideas, um, the most creative ideas. So there are so many different ways. Uh, if it is a, an institution, a school where the children are in groups, we engage the teacher or the facilitator or the caregiver uh, and have a session, a brainstorm session. And it depends on the age. It could be drawings or collage or models. Uh, we usually organize uh, what we call site safaris, that is going around the site and, and looking and discovering the, the best uh, sites or the best uh, features of the site. And, and then the children make drawings. And then they tell us what they like, what they do not like, and what they would like to add or, or change. And, and we take the drawings as responses. And we tally the, the, the items in the drawings as a response. It could be surveys if the children are older, a surveys of the teachers, caregivers, parents, or uh, community members. Uh, if it is a, a membership organization like a museum, a zoo, a botanical garden, we do a member surveys too. That's great, Nelda. And Dilafruz, do you have one more thing you want to say? I was just going to say ditto to what uh, uh, Robin just said. We involve kids, love it to you know design, and they they don't have to be 
perfect, right? They're not necessarily uh, folks with our architecture des, uh, degrees, but they're amazing. As Nilda said, you know, they are unique in terms of what they come up with, and it's, it's fabulous. So we are coming to Michigan. That's great, Dilafirs, and we are coming to a close here. Let me just repeat the questions that we will answer later, just so you know that we've got these. One was, um, kid, uh, are there good resources for kid-friendly plants that can take wear and tear? That's one of them. We had another question, how immersive do these kinds of learning experience need to be to reap the benefits? We had another question, what can you do in urban areas where there's limited outdoor green space? Another question about how can we capitalize on students' interest in technology to help use technology, and a couple of you mentioned that, to help um, with outdoor learning. Is there a way to combine technology and outdoor learning? And then a final question, is there research that shows a connection between outdoor play and actually caring about the environment and stewardship values? So all our speakers, I'll collect these, see if I can get your thoughts on these, and we will share them and we will post resources as, as well. But I wanted to give each of our speakers one final closing thought to end uh, the, the webinar with, and we've had some great comments about how much people have appreciated this and how much more detail we could go into in the future. So I'll go back to the, well, maybe we'll start with the end and go forward. So Dilafruz, do you wanna go first, closing thoughts? Oh, absolutely. I just say that I, um, that gardens offer so much to us. They're a gift. And uh, they remind us that we are part of nature and uh, not separate from nature. And uh, I feel like it's just a blessing to be able to, you know, to be uh, surprised in the garden. And I think I, I just do this work because I love it so much. And I hope everyone else has the same enthusiasm for it. Thank you, Dilla Fruz. And Nilda? Well, what I'm going to say, I want to say start young. And uh, there is no age for these. Start young and very late, right? Uh, so, and a little bit of nature every day, it's enough uh, for replenishing the tank, I would say. Uh, I, I'm, I'm hearing that uh, a question about how immersive these environments need to be. Well, as immersive as possible, but just a little dose every day. It goes. <laughs> and Robin. So I can answer the question about child resistant plants. I have a book called Plants for Play. <laughs> it's okay. still out there. <laughs> um, but um, my thought is uh, just about the response to this webinar. It's really encouraging to see so many environmental educators across the country interested, responsive engaged and enthusiastic about what we have to say. You know, we're all in this together and it's gotta be a revolution, kind of soft green <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. revolution. But we've gotta keep pushing the limits, you know, because we know the planet is in bad shape. And unless we have a next generation growing up with a different set of values that really understand our dependency on the biosphere, um, we're in for a bad time. It's really serious business. So thank you. Thank you all. And even we have two more questions as well. So we will pull these. Erica had a question, but I just want to say what Doreen wrote in in the question and answer. What a great hour. It has spoken to me in a very deep way. I am a late bloomer in gardening, but I volunteered with children for many years. So thank you very much. So we will collect all these questions. Um, there is a, let's give a virtual applause to all our speakers and thank you all so much. And we'll be sending resources out to all of you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you. you.